Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Public Health and Faith webinar. Um, we're going to start in a minute or so to give everyone a chance to get on and uh, kind of get settled here. So, But again, we're just so thrilled to have you here today and uh, really appreciate it. So in one minute, we'll be starting. Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is uh, Joe Gogler. I am the director of the Bold Public Health Center of Excellence on Dementia Caregiving. Uh, really thrilled to have you here for the second installment of our webinar series, Public Health and Faith. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to join us. We have a really fabulous group of presenters here today that are going to really touch on what we feel is a critical topic when we consider public health and brain, uh, and brain health. Uh, and care, which is uh, working in partnership with our many, many faith communities. Um, next slide, please. Um, just a little bit about me uh, as a director. Uh, I'm, we are here at the University of Minnesota, but our Bold Public Health Center of Excellence on Dementia Caring is really and truly a national center. We uh, feature and include roughly 25 or so national organizations all in the space of supporting those who care for individuals living with dementia. Um, and uh, again, our goal is really as a center is to elevate dementia caregiving as a public health concern, to disseminate best practices, information, tools, and resources to help support not only public health agencies, but other organizations in their efforts to help those who uh, care for individuals living with dementia, specifically uh, those unpaid caregivers, family members, friends, and others. Next slide, please. We'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Uh, the University of Minnesota Twin Cities is located on traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of indigenous people. We acknowledge with gratitude the land itself and the people. We take to heart and commit through action to learn and honor the traditional cultural Dakota values courage, wisdom, respect, and generosity. And I think you'll see um, as uh, this, this webinar unfolds today that. Uh, our presenters very much uh, live up to and exceed uh, these very, very important values. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the center, really briefly, it's designed to support all different kinds of public health agencies and their efforts and across the country in developing dementia caregiving fo focused programs. And, and how we do that is first, by improving access to evidence-based programs and supports that exist to best to most effectively help and assist those who care for individuals living with dementia. Secondly, uh, we take great pride in being able to facilitate connections and collaboration, really serving as a convener amongst public health agencies and many other organizations around this space of how do we best support those who help people living with dementia. And then finally, our center does offer a wide range of technical assistance for identifying, selecting, and implementing effective public health interventions and strategies to, again, support uh, families, friends, other un unpaid individuals who help those living with dementia. Next slide. I'm going to turn it over to our moderator today, Dr. Lauren Parker from Johns Hopkins. Uh, Dr. Parker is a longtime colleague of mine. She serves on the leadership committee of the Bold Public Health Center of Excellence on Dementia Caregiving. She also is a member of what's called our Health Equity Task Force. A major emphasis of our center is to uh, center issues of health equity uh, and health disparities throughout the work of our center. And Dr. Parker um, is a noted expert in this space. So Dr. Parker, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Joe, for that warm introduction. I'm delighted today to uh, welcome our speakers and provide a short bio for each one of them. I'll start off with Alfredine and Allison Benson. They are a dynamic mother and daughter duo. They both are caregivers to a loved family member with dementia, and they are both the members of the Allen Temple AME Church in Georgia. We will also hear from Chelsea Ridley. She serves as the Tennessee's Department of Health Dementia Friendly community coordinator. Chelsea has served in various public health roles, but has a passion for serving Tennessee's older adult population, specifically those experiencing memory loss. We will also hear from Pamela Price. 
Pamela is the deputy director of the Balm and Gilead and leading national organization developing educational and training programs specifically designed to establish sustainable integrated systems of public health and faith principles. The Balm and Gilead Incorporated has developed an international reputation for providing an insightful understanding of religious cultures, values, and extraordinary abilities to build strong trusted partnerships with faith communities worldwide. Sheila Welch will be our next speaker. Sheila is the developer and coordinator of Loving Through Dementia, a free all volunteer support education and resource ministry. She is the author of Standing Still, a guide for loving through Alzheimer's and related dementia and other free resources found on lovingthroughdementia.org. And finally, We'll hear from Mary Eck with U.S. Um, Aging and Dr. Faron Epps, the founder of the ALSA program and assistant professor of the Neil Hodgson's Woodruff School of Nursing, who will join us today as a facilitator for our further conversations. After we hear from each of the speakers, we will have a Q&A section. So please feel free to have questions and drop them in the Q&A box. And we will answer those questions at the end of the presentation. So buckle your seatbelts and get ready to hear an exciting and wonderful presentation today. I'll turn it over to Dr. Epps and Alfred Dean and Allison Vinson. Thank you so much, Dr. Parker, um, and welcome everyone. Um, for our panel, this is the Caregiver's Perspective panel, and we will have some conversation, some great conversation um, with Ms. Alfredine, Ms. Allison, and, and their guests, Mr. Alfred. And um, before they introduce themselves, um, themselves I want to let you all know that um, Ms. Alfredine and Ms. Allison are members of Allen Temple AME, Church, which is a uh, faith partner with the ALTA program, which is a dementia outreach program for African-American faith communities. Um, so I'm really glad that they accepted the invitation and were willing to share their journey. So we'll start off and have you all introduce yourself. So Ms. Alfredine, if you'd like to go first. Well, thank you. Um, I am Alfredine Benton, and this is my father, Alfred Scott, who just turned 96 years old. So uh, say hello, daddy. Hello there. <laughs> hey, what's up? Happy, happy <laughs> birthday, Mr. Alfred. <laughs> oh, thank you so very much. You're welcome. <laughs> and, and there's my daughter. <laughs> hello, I am Allison Benson, the daughter and the granddaughter of those two. Those two right there. <laughs> Great. And so, Ms. Allison and um, Ms. Alfredine, do you mind sharing um, how long you've been supporting your, your, your father and grandfather? Um, my mother passed in 2013, and I moved uh, after the, my husband passed. I moved back home uh, with dad and began taking care of him uh, at that time. Then in 2018, um, my son-in-law passed, and we ended up having Allison and her daughter, Alicia, move in with us. So we have four generations in this household. And um, as daddy progressed and got older, of course, more responsibility uh, on Allison and I started shifting. And we kind of winged it for a while because we were just going with the flow until... Um, our church member, Myra Scott, introduced us to you, Dr. Epps, and we went through an assessment with my father. And, and things started changing because we were, we were kind of in a rut at the beginning before we met, uh, got uh, connected with Alta. Um, we were just depending on each other and trying to figure out what to do. And every now and then Google and see what's going on, you know. And right. um, uh, I think that's that was the beginning for us once Myra introduced us to the program. Thank you. Allison, is there anything you would like to add? No, just that the fact that um, knowing that my mom needed help and coming in, as we say, blinded, um, 
that, you know, we we really tried on our own to do the um do the impossible, you know, because we didn't have any information on how to really take care of my grandfather. We've seen it, but really didn't understand the steps. And that's when our little support group came before we did um, the altar. So, so let's start, let's talk about that, right? Because I see mm-hmm. your background and that beautiful picture in your background, which I know <laughs> is Allen Temple AME, but we can let everybody know that is <laughs> Allen Temple AME, that was, I believe, was um, actually uh, the artist is a member of Allen Temple, yes. correct? Yes. So let's talk, let's dig a little bit more and let's speak to how has your faith community, how has Allen Temple helped you on this journey? Well. Once uh, Myra began getting information for us, uh, she talked with the pastor because our membership is uh, majority senior citizens uh, and the elderly. And we realized, pastor realized uh, along with Myra that, oh, it's a lot of us who need some support. And Myra pulled together those of us who were taking care of our uh, fathers and mothers and aunts family members. and all the family members. And we ended up forming the Majestic Care Partners. And we are learning a lot about dementia as well as learning how to take care of ourselves. That was the one thing that we discovered. We were mm-hmm. so busy taking care of everybody else, but we were not taking care of ourselves. And that's what has been a stronghold for us. Yeah. Okay. And just as uh, Myra, would, when she sought altar, you know, and she had followed the, we had a theme that it was build, I'm trying to make sure I said it right, build it and the people will come. And that's what she did with us. She, we went, when she first introduced us to altar, it was a sign of relief, you know? And we we kind of took this little group that was just going through things and really looked at it and, you know, listened to everyone and realized we really weren't by ourselves. And we attend, <laughs> Myra makes sure we're at workshops and get information so that we're con- continuously uh, learning. Mm-hmm. And she has done so much. She's become certified, a certified trainer. So <laughs> we're really doing, and our group has increased. It mm-hmm. started up with just three of us, mm-hmm. and now mm-hmm. it's 12 of, 12 us. of us. Wow. Mm-hmm. And that, all of us are taking care of each other now. That mm-hmm. is great. And so it sounds like, as you all are talking, that um, it, it has working, I mean, having Myra, which we need to be clear, y'all, Myra Scott is the um, <laughs> ambassador for yes. the altar program for Allen Temple AME. So she brings all the information back that she learns and bring it brings it back sure. to the um, faith community. So, um, but it sounds like you feel empowered. I mean, am I putting words? Oh, in no, yes. <laughs> As after we have really learned about altar it has empowered us as caregivers it has given us uh great benefits that we can use towards my grandfather and practice for me to use you know when <laughs> my mother gets of that age you know and um it it really helps someone like me who is the third generation who now understands and can can share it with our generation because let's face it, it's our generation who and my daughters who are taking care of our parents and our grandparents. You know, so um, it just offered a lot of insight of mm-hmm. what we can do to not only help benefit our, our persons we're caring for, but like my mom said, us as well in the process. And also, also my granddaughter is, is 13. And she's starting early to learn and recognize so that by the time Allison gets of age, Mm -hmm. she will know the facts and 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 uh, will be an expert at it because we are uh, 
four generations in this household learning at the same time. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Well, thank you. Now I want to talk and Mr. Alfred, you feel free to chime in at any given Do you time. Want to say anything about us giving. Yeah. Or just speak. What does, what does Alan Temple mean to you? You know, that, that I think that's very just important. Say, what, what does Alan Temple mean to you? It, Alan Temple means life. I have been there over 70 years and I have am the last of the trustees of Allen Temple AME Church. I am the only person who spent 25 years as superintendent of the <laughs> Sunday school. I'm the last trustee age was. So Allen Temple has really been my life, beginning with the Bishop Wilkes up to the present time. I have served as a trustee since 1946, okay. and I am <laughs> very, very welcome to say that Allen <laughs> Temple is the integral part of my life. Thank you see you where so Allison much. gets it from? <laughs> yeah, I see where Allison gets that. But no, thank you so much for sharing <laughs> that, Mr. Thank Alfred, you, because we needed to hear how important your membership with your faith community is. is. And I think everyone needs to hear that. And Ms. Alfredine and, and Ms. Allison, I would love for you all to share what does it mean to you to have Allen Temple recognize how important it is to be in a program with ALTER, to recognize how important it is to develop programs to support their, their caregivers and the, the care partners that are parishioners of Allen Temple AME. So what does that mean to you all, especially with your, your father and your um, granddad's history um, with Allen Temple and being on the trustee board? Well, I think is church is vitally important. It, uh, it's just a priority in our life. And for us to be able to connect with Alter uh, at this point in our life is truly uh, the most positive thing that can happen mm -hmm. at this time. And through us, we can show others in the community how we can partner with the public health and other organizations in assisting our members in getting through this stage of life and making it comfortable, not only for the person we love, but for our, us and our family members. And I think that's vitally important. Yeah. And the support takes a lot of stress off of us as caregivers because our support system helps us stop and deep breathe and gives us time to uh, revamp ourselves so we can have the patience and the courage and the kindness and the love that our loved ones deserve. Thank you. Miss Allison, would you like to add on to that? It, it's just I, she said everything that I would say, and it also to it also helped us know that our church family understands us. Our our community has an outlet because before we didn't have an outlet. It was just us leaning on each other and calling Myra twenty four seven. Okay, but with Alter, it gives us an outlook. It give us it give us care. Give us hope. Because a lot of us don't have that hope and we think that we're doing all that we can. And it turns out we're doing it, but there's something else that we can add to it. You know, and like Dr. Elvis, you know, you you become family to us now. You know, we didn't have you before. So it's like, I wish I had you when we first started it. <laughs> so that way, you know, I would be more calmer and not all over the place, you know, so... I, I truly believe that being with the faith base and you um, is really a great, great thing. This is a great program. It be, yeah. not only a program, it becomes a family. Mm -hmm. That's that's you what I it. want. Yes. 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 We are a family now. 
Yeah, because it, it takes a village, right? It, yes, it yes. takes a village, and that's understanding that that African pro proverb. You know, it, you know, it takes a village to raise a child, but if mm -hmm. we just say it takes a village, yeah. Um, there and then be able to add to support someone living with dementia you know yes. I think we just really need to understand that um and thank you for that because yeah you're right we are family yes <laughs> um, and so and I love Alan Temple AME and I would hope that you all can share with maybe the audience uh, more that Alan Temple AME is doing under the direction we do want to recognize Reverend Susan Buxton Mm -hmm. And so under her leadership and her direction, what other things are going on besides just that support group? Or what are things coming out of uh, the Majestic Care Partner Group um, other than just meeting? What are some additional activities that you all are doing um, and Allen Temple is supporting? Well, we go out sometimes and just go and uh, explore different restaurants so that we can have time for ourselves to do a woosaw. Uh, we've also planned, uh, we call it staycations. It may be for a day or for two days, but we've been planning staycations uh, along with uh, just a lot of fun things for us to bond as caregivers and also support each other. Right. And we also do it through the family. We invite families to come mm -hmm. with us, you know, and uh, help each other. And there have been times when we've had emergencies uh, amongst the families and each one of us have had to go and help out, you know. So uh, that's what we've done. We've also done little paint and sips where we sip on non-alcoholic beverages <laughs> and paint. <laughs> uh, painting has become... Uh, a, a integral part of our activities, painting and exercising. I think we've had jazzercise also, and we've had um, uh, crossword puzzles and reading. We've done tie-dye painting. We've done uh, gardening. We've, we've done a lot of different activities each month so that that will give us time to uh, have a stress be a stress three zone. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's great. And I do remember that jazzercise. I, I showed yes. up with the wrong yes. and y'all was doing that. You had me sweating out my hairstyle. Right. <laughs> um, so thank you for sharing that because I think it's really important for everyone to know that what are those things the faith community is doing, um, not, not just the support group and meeting, but what are actually those activities that are being supported mm -hmm. by the faith community? And I know when I came to worship and to events there, just being able to see some of the artwork that you all have mm -hmm. done and display, it started a conversation piece. Right. Um, and I really think that's how you all have been able to reach out to other caregivers and care partners that's yeah. within the Allen Temple um, family. Mm -hmm. um, because like you said, build it and, and, and they will come. Yes, ma'am. So as we wrap up, are there any final words you all would like to share? I just hope that it, it continues to grow because ALTER is a life-saving program, in my opinion. It is really a life-saving program for us. And I hope that as we continue to move through that we continue to spread the word and show and talk to people that you're one, you're not alone. And two, that altar has the right tools and the way to help you to help the ones that you love. Cause I love my mom and granddad <laughs> and I, I want to, to be here forever if I could. And I, with the help of altar, I believe I can do more than I've done without you all. And I also think it's so important because people are living longer mm -hmm. now and have different health issues. And I just think it's important that the community through churches and other organizations uh, unite together uh, to inform and support each other as we've mm -hmm. done here and get the word out that there is help. You are yes. not alone. You are not alone. 
Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Alfred, Ms. Alfred Dean. Thank you. And Dave. Allison. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so very much. You're welcome. I appreciate you all again, your willingness um, and just being able to share your journey and your in your connection with your, your faith family um, in the church is very important. Um, and so I ask that you all stay on because we'll have some questions um, later on. And I do want to put it out there, audience. This was not a paid commercial for Alter. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I did not tell them to say those things, but okay. I do appreciate it as the leader and the founder for Alter program. I do appreciate mm -hmm. those kind words. And they're also encouraging for us to continue to reach out to African-American faith communities yes. to give them these resources. Yes, so and I, we I, appreciate you all. I yes, we do. You. Right. And so next we'll move on to Chelsea, who's going to share about the great work that is happening um, in Tennessee and with faith communities. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for asking us um, to speak today about our experiences in engaging faith communities in our public health efforts. My name is Chelsea Ridley and I serve as the Tennessee Dementia Friendly Community Coordinator at the Tennessee Department of Health. And I hope that public health folks on the call will be able to take something away from our presentation. We'll, able to be, we'll be able to use the information um, in their own work moving forward. So I think it's important to revisit the essential services of public health. Um, part of our role as public health practitioners is to effectively communicate with those that we're serving and ensure we support partners in communities to improve health and ensure equitable access to resources and services needed to be healthy. So these essential services um, are crucial to the work that we're, we do. Um, and where the boots on the ground work occurs. So the work that we do as public health agencies would not be possible without our critical partnerships and communication efforts. And often this work requires, requires us to meet people um, where they are and where they go. So, which is why faith community engagement is super important. Next slide. So a few things about um, Tennessee's religious landscape. According to the Pew Research Center, 81% of adults in Tennessee identify as being part of the Christian faith. Only 15% of adult Tennesseans don't identify with any religious um, group or are unsure about their religious affiliation. So religious affiliation in Tennessee obviously is extremely important and the overwhelming majority of adult Tennesseans report religion being very important or somewhat important to them. Next slide. So you've already talked about the importance of religion among adult Tennesseans, um, providing the perfect opportunity for large group engagement. There are also other reasons why engaging faith communities is so critical. So I'm sure it's not unique um, to Tennessee that faith leaders tend to be trusted leaders in, among their congregation members and in their community. These are the individuals people will go to for help and um, guidance. So ensuring these leaders have access to accurate information and resources offers opportunities to reach more individual, individuals with accurate information. Faith leaders and congregations are there during times of need and crisis and have been um, as long as we can remember, right? So they have historically played a role in responding to natural disasters by providing shelter, clothing, food, safety. Um, they were critical in responding to the needs of, commu of the community um, during the COVID-19 pandemic by ensuring congregation members um, received accurate information. Um, they helped with vaccine distribution. And of course they comforted families um, during times of sorrow and death. 
And we know that faith organizations provide those in the community and in their congregations with services like helping with grocery shopping or providing childcare. So faith organizations are overall well prepared to serve and support those in the community and with additional support can expand their capabilities. Next slide. So I want to share a little bit about our approach and where we are headed um, in Tennessee related to engaging faith communities and public health activities. So through COVID-19, it was very apparent that support for older adults and resource navigation for community members um, was absolutely necessary and very much needed. So we wanted to be sure that we addressed the needs of the community prop providing resources and tools that allow faith organizations to support their congregation members and their community in times of need, specifically among those aging members. Of course, we know that um, the aging population was heavily impacted um, by COVID-19, whether it was through um, social isolation or um, through illness. So that special population is just very near and dear um, and very much needed to be served. So building off successes from previous grants, we partnered um, with the University of Tennessee Chattanooga to establish a train the trainer model um, where we're hosting open houses, regional training opportunities, and faith summits to engage faith communities and provide the tools and resources they need related to supporting those in their communities with chronic conditions, those with Alzheimer's or related dementias, um, caregivers. And we also wanted to be sure that we provided tools that also address emergency preparedness, um, crisis intervention, or advanced care planning. So to be able to provide the deep dives into each topic and reach as many faith groups as possible, we had to ensure that we had a partnership plan and a sustainability model. Um, each partner organization working on this specific program has expertise in their specific um, topic area that they're providing deep dives into and has shown success um, with various target populations. Next slide. So the key partners that we have um, engaged in this program are provided on the screen. I think it's important to recognize that we as um, public health agencies don't have to do it all and that we have um, established partnerships and opportunities for additional partnerships to meet the needs of our community members. Um, it also allows faith leaders to meet and engage with other organizations and community leaders that they may not have engaged with before, um, allowing them to expand their network further. So partnership and engaging um, nonprofit organizations, the academic world, um, and other groups is just really important in any work that we do but again, provides a really solid um, foundation and opportunity for faith communities to engage further with those in their local community. Next slide. So what have we learned so far through this program? We are in the early stages still, but we are hitting the ground running. I think the first thing to keep in mind is that each faith group will have a different starting point. So some faith groups are already working um, on different issues related to various health topics, but others will not have programs in their um, congregations geared toward um, health and supporting those older adults. So some might have model programs that they want to share and some will not. And we've learned already that some groups have um, day programs for older adults um, and their congregations that they're happy to share the information and share information about how they got started. So the level of resources and trainings um, needed will be different and the resources that 
um, they need will be very different. Their volunteer capabilities and funding will be different. So prepare for all levels of readiness um, and cultural differences with language and beliefs um, when engaging your various faith communities in your respective community or state. Another thing that we've learned is that faith communities recognize the need um, and they're ready to help serve. So they saw during the COVID-19 pandemic and even before that gaps in services and needs, especially among their older adult populations, um, exist. So they're ready to serve and they are eager to access um, the information. Um, it's just really important, of course, to try to engage, especially those hard to reach communities, whenever um, you're working with the faith group, because oftentimes, especially like if you live in a state like Tennessee, our rural areas um, really have a lack of service and, and resource knowledge. Um, and a lot of times it's just because they haven't had someone to help them access the information before. Next slide. So I've provided my contact information on this slide. Um, if anyone has any questions, I've also um, provided Dr. Christy Wick's contact information. She's with the UTC School of Nursing. And you all can reach out anytime. Um, we're happy to answer any questions about kind of our approach, um, what we've done thus far, and just ways that public health can further engage with faith communities. Thank you all. Chelsea, thank you um, for that presentation. Um, my name is Mary Eck and I am the Director of Dementia Friendly America um, and Dementia Friendly America is administered by US Aging. And we um, serve communities who are working toward being dementia friendly by providing technical assistance and resources to those communities. Um, and these are communities that commit to a multi-sector approach to dementia friendliness. And um, we have a network of over 350 communities across the nation. Um, we also are the administrators of the Dementia Friends Program, which is an opportunity for individuals to become dementia friends. And I just have to say it is such a privilege to be on this call today with um, such a committed group of people. So thank you because it just it's it's just always great to get this inspiration um, from all of you and to remind us of how important this work is. So thank you again for that. Um, we are going to jump into a panel discussion, and we will start with um, with Chelsea. Um, we have a few questions, Chelsea, that we're hoping that you can answer. And also joining us will be Pamela Price from Balm and Gilead and Sheila Welch. Um, but we'll start with some questions for um, for Chelsea. And, and then I believe we'll have, you can, um, if you have questions, we'll have time for Q&A after for, for our audience. Um, we'll have an opportunity to ask you questions as well. So Chelsea, just um, in, in looking at the work that um, Tennessee has done with faith communities, can you tell us a little bit more about um, how you discovered the need to engage with, with faith communities and what that decision was like within your department? that decision-making process to engage with the faith community. Can you sure. just expand on that a bit more? Thanks. Absolutely. So um, going back, gosh, many years ago, even before COVID-19, um, there was a, a huge need to, I mentioned that Tennessee has a lot of rural, rural areas. Um, and of course we have a lot of um, health disparities that exist in Tennessee due to socioeconomic reasons, social determinants of health. Um, and I mentioned that uh, Tennessee has a, the, most Tennesseans put a lot of um, emphasis on their, on their faith and um, the importance of faith in their own personal lives. So the faith community and faith organizations themselves offer a way 
for um, public health agencies and any other agency really that wants to um, meet people where they are um, and easily, because this is where we know that many of our people um, in our state go to access the, the resources and information. Um, we had done in the department some, some work individually on different little programs, different projects um, with different faith groups. Um, but COVID-19 really kind of shined a light on um, the need to support older adults in the community um, and the role that the faith organizations and faith groups played during the pandemic. This is where people were going to access um, resources, um, help with their loved ones, especially those experiencing memory loss. Um, and so it just made a lot of sense to engage the faith community um, and focus on providing the resources because this is where the people were going to access that information anyway. Great, thank you. I think I think we've found the same with Dementia Friendly America in our sector approach that that our faith communities are um, are one of the most active sectors, um, and we'd like to you know um, we we would certainly like to join you in your efforts, um, Chelsea, so we can talk more about that how DFA can support your work um, as you. You know, as you think about the process of engaging faith communities um, in your work, can you tell us what were the challenges that you encountered and maybe share a little bit about the response that you received from faith communities when you when you began um, engaging with them in this work? Sure, I mentioned that we um, have a lot of partner organizations that we're working with. Um, our lead, we chose to work with an academic institution just based on some previous um, proven work with that academic institution, especially related to dementia and Alzheimer's. So um, we have had a really broad ap approach in trying to reach um, faith organizations where we have multiple partners that are engaged on this project. Um, many of those partners had already been in touch with faith communities. Many um, already had relationships in, the, in um, various areas of the state. So um, we did a lot of marketing <laughs> to mm -hmm. engage faith communities, um, getting the word out through those nonprofit organizations, through any listserv that we have um, here at the Department of Health, we have a health disparities task force with a large um, faith community presence. So when we're trying to engage the faith communities, we um, really utilize the partnerships that exist around the state to get the word out to those faith communities um, to make sure that they are aware of the project and aware that it's occurring. Great. And what would you say was um, your biggest surprise in reaching out in, in terms of what you saw already happening um, in faith communities that was related to the work you wanted to do? Um, I think one of the biggest surprises was that um, people have kind of been waiting for this <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and ready to start. Um, and asking for this, honestly, I think that's been a huge um, pleasant surprise. Um, I think another surprise is, you know, we have done a lot of, a lot of outreach in our rural communities, but sometimes it's just so hard to reach, um, those individuals and those groups. So I think positive, um, surprises mostly, um, but still sometimes very hard to reach those um, that we're trying to reach, especially um, in those rural areas of the state. Great. And, and, you know, it's obvious that your department is embedding this work, um, embedding faith communities in your work. Um, do you have any plans for the future in terms of further engagement with faith communities based on what you've learned so far that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, I think um, our department is heavily focused on um, the work 
and the value of faith communities and what those connections um, offer. Um, do I have specific exam examples right now? No, but I think through this work, you know, this project um, should be going on for about another year, if not longer. Um, so we have a sustainability kind of um, model or plan in place through, you know, engaging volunteers um, through the train the trainer model um, and making the, the resources available online. So hopefully um, as more connections are built um, the um, initiatives moving forward will feel more organic. Great, great. Anything else you want to share with the group before we go to our next panelist, um, knowing that we will have time at the end for questions and answer, answers? I don't think so. Um, I welcome you all to reach out. So if you have any questions, um, you have my contact. Great. Thanks, Chelsea. And, and I know for sure I will be reaching out. Um, we would love to be added to that partner list and support you in your work. So thank you again for your for your time today and for, for sharing your information. Um, I think next we'll jump to Pamela. Hi, Pamela. Welcome. Hi. Um, good afternoon, Pamela. everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning. Well, good afternoon and good morning to those of you, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, so, Pamela, I thought it, you could start by just telling us a little bit more about Balm and Gilead for people that aren't familiar with with your organization. Sure, absolutely. Um, it, and actually, so before yeah, I shift into that kind of hat, I kind of want to protocol having been established. I really do want to. Uh, commend uh, Elder Alfred, Alfred Benton and that Benton family. Um, I, I didn't have access or my family didn't have access to a Dr. Epps or a, uh, an altar program. And we lost my grandfather uh, due to Alzheimer's. And so I really, again, just, I didn't want to get into kind of anything else without first thanking that family for their transparency, thanking them for uh, sharing, thanking them really for being what the bombing Gilead is about, uh, which is about um, harnessing uh, what we know, especially as minority communities, what we know uh, to be a foundation, not just for our spiritual lives, but for our physical lives as well. Um, so I'm the deputy director um, for the Bomb and Gilead. I also serve as the director for um, our National Brain Health Center for African Americans. Um, so that is my one of my two roles <laughs> uh, here. I pretty much oversee all of our many, many um, programs. Um, but the heart of what this organization about is really about equipping our faith communities and our partners uh, to really be able to have the, not only the information and have the awareness, but to have the resources, to have the skill set, uh, to have the, uh, the education and to also have the support. And that support is not just, uh, you know, materials. It's not just, you know, marketing and, and pamphlets and handouts and toolkits. It's also financial support um, so that they can actually continue to do the work that historically they have always done. Um, and then the other arm of the organization is about just what this, um, you know, webinar is about. It's about how uh, faith and public health should and can come together to really um, eliminate, you know, the disparities and the inequities that for centuries, decades, <laughs> we have been talking about and, and spent time, efforts, money um, on addressing them. Um, and so for the public health efforts, it's about really uh, helping public health, academia, um, non-faith uh, partners, if you will, not only understand the role of the faith community um, in rural settings and minority settings, um, but to really understand the culture, how, how faith is a part of us culturally and what that means in terms of driving our decision-making, what it means in terms of driving our behaviors. Um, and then not taking that knowledge that now you can understand and how do you weave that and connect that to what you're doing as a public health or academic um, type of institution so that it becomes embedded in your culture that it doesn't become a, a one-off program because you got some grant funding that 
charged you to go work with faith communities, but it is embedded into your organization's mission and objective to say, we want to do this. So that is our role <laughs> here as an organization um, in this particular space. Great, great. Thanks, Pamela. Um, so when we think about churches and faith communities um, and addressing the needs of dementia caregivers, um, what what need um, that you see that caregivers have? Where, how is the church especially well positioned, or how are faith communities especially well positioned to meet to meet the needs of caregivers? Um, and, and some of it, again, I think why it was so great kicking off uh, with the Bitten family, because some of those needs, one is just, yes, the, the information. Um, so the Bible tells us the people perish for a lack of knowledge, right? And so church is where we know we come to be fed. We come to be fed spiritually with the word, but we also know that our churches are situated to feed us educationally as well. And so our churches really do need to be able to be educated on um, you know, disease state awareness, on what behavioral interventions are available, on what's happening on the policy level and how that could impact their congregations and their communities. So really being able to inundate um, churches with that type of really holistic education and information is really, really important. Um, I think second, uh, you know, in terms of a need is that um, they need to be able to have access to bi-directional and mutual based relationships. Um, I know we like to use the word partnerships. The Bomb and Gillen likes to really try to steer people towards building relationships. You can walk away from a partnership. Partnerships may be, I, got, I, I give this, you give that, and then we're done. A relationships means I'm making an investment. And I may not get anything for my investment. <laughs> um, and so we really, um, uh, our churches are, uh, again, really eager. They're open, but they are looking for relationship building. Um, and that relationship building then gets us to the third thing, which is the sustainability. Um, so again, we they, they historically have always been there. Our churches will, I think, always continue to rise up and meet the challenges of the needs of their communities uh, and the individuals in which they are shepherding and feel that they are being, you know, called to, to, to lead and to serve. Um, and so I think, you know, what we're trying to do is to get other organizations to come alongside uh, in this spirit of, serv of, of servanthood. Thank you. You know, we, we think about, um about the church and we're learning more and more of the role um, that the church and faith communities play in, in public health. Um, and also recognizing, um, as you mentioned, and as um, as Chelsea also mentioned, that it is often a place, you know, where people feel the safest and secure and, you know, and they, the church is often, or their faith community is often their most trusted resource. Um, can you say a little bit more about um, the role that you feel faith communities um, play in public health as, in, as serving in a public health role? Absolutely. Um, so those of us who, you know, are in the public health space, I have a public health background, um, you know, we're taught on those principles or those structures, you know, of public health. Our churches have those same structures, believe it or not. Um, so again, I think if we started to see our churches, um, our faith and religious institutions, um, to see that they are structurally designed to some fashion, the same way public health is designed, they do assess just like we assess. They do education and outreach, same as public health. Um, they do education. They provide, re you know, so a lot of the same tenants, both in terms of structure and then also in terms of actual like activity, um, our churches are engaged in this to some fashion. Now, each church is different <laughs> and you'll have some churches who are <laughs> leaps and bounds, you know, um, you know, more equipped or better equipped uh, than other churches. But, you know, for us, we work with churches nationally and internationally of all sizes of all kind of you know religious backgrounds um, and creeds um, you know really starting everyone on an equitable foundation 
of, you know, of, of resources, of their education, of advocacy, of mobilization, which is like our strategic kind of uh, plan that we use when we're engaging with um, faith communities. And so, you know, I think, yeah, it's, it's sometimes it's easy to think and see our churches again as just these kind of places of worship people come to uh, and then they leave. There's tons of things that happen in our churches literally from Sunday to Sunday. And I think public health mm -hmm. needs to uh, figure out which day, not Sunday, unless mm -hmm. you are really, again, unless you have a really good relationship, you might can get a Sunday after church. <laughs> uh, you might can get a Wednesday after Bible study, but if you, you know, if your relationship is a little shaky, they, they may offer you a Tuesday, they may offer you a Saturday, but I think it's getting in to say, and I think it was mentioned by the bit, um, by the Bitten family. Um, the fact that Dr. Epps has gone to their service, not wanting anything, not sharing more information about the altar program, she went to worship and fellowship with them. And I, I, I wanted to make sure to kind of highlight that because I think that's what um, public health has to shift to do better is that you have to be present and be present simply to just be present, learn, connect, not come with any other agenda, objective, but that's where the engagement should start so that you really, again, can build that relationship. Um, and so that, you know, again, regardless of kind of what you want to do next, like, for example, we started out with a five state diabetes prevention program about five years ago now. It was all focused on preventing uh, type two diabetes. We now are doing Alzheimer's uh, work within the same infrastructure. Um, we're doing mental health work. Uh, we've got a broadband enrollment to get individuals enrolled into the uh, affordable connectivity program, which again, most rural people don't know. They've made it as most federal programs, they've made it extremely difficult to get enrolled and determine if you're eligible. But we're using, again, this faith based, faith created infrastructure to be able to put on top of it any type of uh, you know, behavioral intervention, evidence-based interventions and programs, and then really just programs that our churches create. Uh, because we also don't wanna be dismissive that sometimes they don't need our programs. They just need us to come in and support something they've already built and created. Um, and I think that's again, where public health is, it's an open lane <laughs> for public health to kind of jump in and get on board to start to fill that space. Well, Haley, you mentioned, um, you know, something that a faith community has already created. Can you think of something that, uh, an effort that you've seen within a faith community that inspired you, either something that was unique or that just kind of gave you the energy to keep going with this work? <laughs> wow. Um, there's been, <laughs> there's been many, and I don't want to get emotional because I mean, I've, I've been doing this kind of public health work for over 20 years now, really dug into the faith work once I joined the Bonnet Gillett almost eight years ago. Um, if there's one that I could uh, come with mine. So before I joined the bomb, I was doing HIV AIDS work um, with the state public health department here. I ran the HIV program here. And same thing, we were doing with every other program. Who do we know? Who can we partner with? Because we want to get with the churches, right? I got a real quick lesson <laughs> on how it should work. Um, one of the really, I think, most inspiring things that I saw was from a, a, a very rural church um, there out in the Dinwiddie area of Virginia, which is like Southwest, not a whole lot of anything um, out there, but churches. <laughs> um, and when we went, again, just to meet the pastor, meet their leadership, they walked us around and they showed us work again that they were already doing with the youth of their church, sharing stories about how they had been impacted by HIV and or AIDS. That would, now granted, is that a program? But that telling your story, we know now, we see that. We see that in, you know, in RFAs, we see it, you know, people calling folks to, hey, let's tell our story. That's something that they were already doing it and they were doing it with young people who sometimes we don't uh, associate automatically with churches. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so just seeing not only what that pastor and she just saw it, she said the reason that she did it is because one, she saw a statistic that we had shared that younger people were 
becoming, um, you know, had higher rates for new infections. Um, and then she also knew uh, that a, a family member, you know, had passed away um, due to uh, AIDS complications. And she wanted to do something. So she didn't wait for us to call. She didn't even go to our website <laughs> to see like what we had going on, which we had tons of behavioral interventions, obviously. But that was just really, really, I think, powerful to see. And, and I got to see firsthand that our pastors, our leaders, you know, in, in our religious and our community spaces, they are seeing and getting access to needs that we are secondary to in the public health space. Um, and so that is a value for them to be able not only to, to see it, but to have them share with how and why they responded to that specific need. Um, and I just, I keep images like, um, you know, Pastor Charles and, and her young, her group of young people there. I, I talk to them all the time where they're gonna do one of our broadband events um, with us. Um, but it's those little small things. It's the sister Marys who don't know anything about Microsoft Excel, but I can ask her to do something or we can ask her to do something. And she's going to call me to tell me, you know, I had 50 people. We gave out X number of this, you know, this was this, this was this. I got to write it all down because she's not going to fill out the form that I sent her two weeks ago. <laughs> uh, you know, it's those things and she's excited. And then she's, you know, the people who call us in January asking about Memory Sunday. <laughs> and I'm like, y'all are planning Memory Sunday and we as the organization, we're not there yet. <laughs> You know, and so it's those oh. small things to, to, to let, you know, that lets us know, you know, we're on the right track. Um, and as I think, as, as Chelsea mentioned, our faith communities um, are well equipped. They are eager. I think, yes, they also too just want to be seen as equitable partners in this conversation. Mm -hmm. Equitable and crucial, and, and yes. just in their unique ability to respond to a need. And I, I think, you know, as it relates to dementia, when we talk about involving youth, we we see in the Benton family that there are four generations um, caring for each other, and so we can't we can't forget the role that youth play in this, and 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 the the role that youth play in faith communities and in the church. So I um, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, before we um, go to our next panelist, do you have anything else you'd like to share um, about, I was going to ask you a question about partnerships, but you've changed my language to relationships, um, to just the relationships that you've, um, that you've developed um, in an effort to collaborate with faith communities. Is there anything else you want to share before we move to our next panelist? Um, I would just to say to, to think outside of the box and be, 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 be fearless, um, I think be authentic. Um, and I think especially just kind of, again, what we've all survived um, over the last you know, two and a half years, I think we, especially in this faith space, um, and especially as we think rural, as we thinking about our underserved communities, our minority communities, I think I want to, within that partnership space, that you really look to make sure that that, in, that diversity and inclusion doesn't become a, a tick mark, that you really, really, really say, I wanna get this right and I wanna get it right across everything. I'm diverse in my partnerships, I'm diverse in my staffing, I'm diverse in my messaging and my communication and my marketing. And I am sensitive uh, to you know, what I put out there, I'm sensitive uh, to really, I, and I think that's the struggle because we really do have to take a step back and to say anyone who I really want to be touched and impacted by a program that I'm creating, can I sit in their shoes for a second? And can I see, can I look through what I'm trying to present through their lens? And I think that's what I would challenge in, in terms of like partnership. So when we've partnered with organizations, that's really the approach that we, we've taken. It's not the, the name recognition, but it's really saying one, how well are you already connected to these communities that you're wanting to serve? Um, how authentic is your commitment to a relationship? Um, because we are one small office here in Richmond, Virginia. And so we rely heavily on opening the door to our congregations and to our faith partners, to an Alzheimer's Association, to a diabetes association chapter, to the AARP, you know, because we, a lot of national orgs have local chapters. We do not. We have churches mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and coalitions uh, in, in many states. Um, and so for us, it's about um, being strategic in those partnerships and that there is some shared 
um, uh, you know, uh, importance, you know, their shared uh, missions and objectives uh, and, and using those as the foundation for uh, establishing, you know, again, the relationships. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Pamela, and Anne, for that reminder about just the, the importance of being um, very intentional about being inclusive. Um, so thank you. And um, I'm sure we'll have more questions for you after we hear from our next panelist. Um, Sheila, welcome back from your introduction. Um, we are thrilled to have Sheila with us. And Sheila um, is with Due West Methodist Church. And um, can you tell us a little bit more about your role, um, Sheila, and then we'll jump into some questions? Oh, you're on mute, Sheila. There you go. <laughs> okay. I am the coordinator and the developer of Loving Through Dementia, which is the dementia ministry at Due West United. Methodist Church. Uh, I'm also the facilitator of the support groups there. And um, my husband and I began this ministry 12 years ago. And it is quite different today than it was then. Not only do we have the mission, the, um, uh, mission of educating and supporting caregivers, care partners, but we also have the mission of helping other churches and communities to find the way that best fits them to support these, these families because it's so critical. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, thank you. And, and it, is, it is critical. How did you um, identify the need in, in your faith community? Um, and, and how did you begin the loving, loving through dementia? Well, I will tell you that it began as the dementia ministry at Due West mm -hmm. and eventually evolved to what I think we really do as people who care for someone who is living with dementia and that is we are loving them through it. Um, the Benton family brought tears to my eyes and they still, the per they are the perfect example of honoring a parent and loving someone through dementia, but loving each other along the way, um, finding joy with each other along the way. So I'm just honored to be here among them and, and among all of you. I thank you so much for what you're doing. It's, it's just very important. So you asked me how I identified the need. Um, it was a very person. It was in a very personal way at first. My mother was the first in her family to be diagnosed with dementia in 1997, and that at that time the word dementia was not talked about very much. And the only resource that I had was the 36-hour day. Um, when I left the doctor's office with the diagnosis with my mother and my father, um, there were no, there was no information given to us. And then fast forward three years after my mother died, which was 15 years after my experience of going out of that doctor's office with no information. We did not know what dementia was. We didn't know what it would mean to my mother. We didn't know what it would mean to our family. And I found myself facilitating a group of men and women um, who were in the exact same situation. They had recently received diagnoses for their loved ones. None of them had dementia educate, none of those care partners, caregivers had dementia education. And almost immediately, I just became convicted that dementia education was necessary to, as Farron said just a little while ago, to empower these families facing dementia. So we had our first conference, we hosted 35 people and we had four, um, volunteers. Since that time, this ministry has hosted over 2,000 families, and we've, we've enjoyed eight, oh, just hundreds of volunteers who come out of the woodwork in the community and within our church. 
this is, um, our program is not for our church only. It is for our community, for Metro Atlanta. We serve other states. And now that we have a website, we, it's global. So we are so excited that this is where, this is how far it's come. The second way that, uh, the way we have come to where we are, I have to say, is, you know, the stories that Pamela was just talking about. Um, I have heard hundreds of stories. I'm, I'm just blessed to have, have heard them. Uh, these folks have shared their most, the, the most intimate parts of their lives, loving their husband or wife, or their mother or father, family member through this illness. And those stories have led us in every way through the ministry. One of the first things that happened after a conference was um, one of our members came up to me and said, Sheila, he was a husband in a family support group. And he said, Sheila, I am tired of listening to these mamas, these daughters talk about their mamas. And he was joking, he, had, he was smiling. Um, but I started thinking about what he was saying because what he said sounded very real to me and was a message that I couldn't put down. And so very soon we began a spouse, a spouse support group and that group has been the, the fastest growing and the largest group for the past nine years. Um, it was in that group that one of the spouses um, explained that his own church um, members and his even his clergy had not visited him in four years. I, I listened as Mr. Alfred spoke about how Alan AME was his life and, I, and how he belonged. These members that I sat with that day longed to belong in their churches. And as those words were spoken, I thought, surely his minister doesn't know this. So what came from those conversations is uh, a leader's workshop that we now offer annually and a website with resources and an action plan for, for churches and communities uh, to choose from. It's a menu. Um, regardless of your resources, there is something on there that can fit your church, your faith community. And um, so since we have now had three of those, that's where I'm at, Fairon. Um, we have had three of those because of COVID. We, we wish we could have had five, but we have had three and eight ministries have grown from that workshop. All of that came because of the stories that these caregivers have shared. Um, and then lastly, and very importantly, the people with dementia themselves have guided us. They have, they have taught me that when we have speakers at these functions, these events, we need to um, the people who live with dementia need to be on that stage. They need to be behind that podium. They are the true experts. And um, so we have become far more inclusive. And part of that is evident. We have an upcoming, um, uh, for the past five years, we have always had someone who lives with dementia as a speaker. Um, and this coming conference, instead of the traditional care get partners conference, which we had become, um, we are now the dementia family conference and people who live with dementia are certainly invited. They are most important attendees. So um, it's, it's the people who have pointed out their needs and we're just trying to meet them. Well, it sounds like you're doing just that, Sheila. Thank you. Um, you know, when we when we look at um, public health, where do you you know where do you see an opportunity for public health agencies to support your work? Um, I'm hoping that uh, public health agencies might, um, in this in this case, I'm going to use the word partner, Pamela, um, <laughs> might. Um, or I, I think I'd rather say join 
join us um, in providing quality dementia speakers. We, we have been so blessed to, because of partnerships, because of sponsorships, we have been so blessed to bring in Dr. Peter Rabin. We partnered with Wellstar to uh, bring in Tifa Snow. Um, we, have, we bring in dementia advocates and experts who can give our attendees, our caregivers, our families, the kind of education that they are hungry for. Great, great. Well, thank you, Sheila, so much for joining us today and, and sharing, um, sharing with us the important work you do. Again, I can't, um, I can't say enough what a privilege it is to be here with such incredible people um, doing just very important work. So thank you for taking the time today. Um, we are going to kind of open up the floor for questions from our audience. Um, and I'm not sure, will, um, will, will somebody be posing those questions from the chat? Yes, so thank you so much. Thank you so much to all of the panelists and speakers. This was a wonderful presentation. So I'll go ahead and get us started with some of the questions that um, are in the chat. Thanks, and so, Lauren. So to all of the um, participants who are here today, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to post those questions in the Q&A box and we'll get to as many as possible. So I'll start off with a question that I thought was very interesting. Um, Someone, an anonymous attendee asks, what are tips to develop relationships with faith-based organizations? So those who have already developed these relationships, what are some of the tips or some of the things that were helpful for you in building these relationships? Um, for, um, I'll, I'll start. So um, for us, I think it, again, and I've kind of touched on a little bit, it was actually um, starting our, engagement with these communities in a very much, you know, tell us about you, <laughs> tell us what's important to you, what are, you know, not only what are things that you're struggling with, but what are some things that are going really, really well that you would love to see, you know, be, you know, to, to expand or to scale. So really, our, you know, any project we've ever kicked off uh, that, again, centers and hinges on you know, our, our relationship with our faith communities, we really start by hosting a breakfast, hosting a lunch, um, you know, again, bringing them together. And it really starting with fellowship um, is, is the best way that I can kind of describe if you start there. And then you are now, you know, hoping to then move into working to get a buy-in. And again, looking at what are some shared synergies that you have with either efforts that the faith community is already doing um, or something that they've addressed that is a need for them and their communities. And then here's how you can come alongside. And I think that's sometimes where the crux is, is that we can't come in with something that we need and or want because it may not always line up with what that church or what that faith community is saying, no, this is what we need. And I think if we can be flexible to say, okay, well, I can meet three of your needs and maybe get one of mine and I can be okay with that. So it's really about looking at, um, you know, again, starting on equal footing and really, um, you know, starting your engagement off with uh, getting to know each other, really getting to see, okay, well, this is what we're trying to do. This is what we've done. This is what we're hoping to do. Uh, and then collectively determining, well, what together will we do? What together will we create uh, within our congregation or within the community? Thank you for that. I was pausing to see if anyone else had any additional thoughts before I went on to the next question. So um, the chat box is lighting up the saying they, they so much appreciated the Benson family and for sharing your story. So I just want to take that time to one say happy birthday, Mr. Alfred. And also thank you for um, being here with us today. I know it's uh, getting a little long. Um, so thank you so much for being here. We really, really, really appreciate you sharing your story and just everything, um, your experiences with the altar program. So another question that we have is uh, from Kelsey Wood. 
when the caregivers are having their stress-free zones and activities, who is caring for their loved one? And is the care at the church or do other church members go to their homes? Um, when we're having our, it's a once a month meeting and most of us have siblings that will come in and sit with our parents. Uh, we also have members who have nurses scheduled to come and sit there. Um, if there's a problem or a need, we have a strong health ministry at the church uh, filled with registered nurses. So someone will be able to uh, help them so they can attend our meetings. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, this is a very interesting question um, from Constance Kizzy Gillett. I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, but from everyone's experiences, um, do you think that women clergy are more accepting on new programs being introduced to their church members? That's a very provocative and interesting question. <laughs> I, can, I can answer that um, a little bit if my puppy lets me answer, but I, I think we engage a lot with women ministry leaders, but it's not because they are more amped to bringing in this program, but it's just that there's more women in the church. Uh, we, we see that a lot, but I have to tell you that I've also had male uh church members and ministry leaders reach out to me and they are just as eager when they do reach out they're just as eager. And um, the thing is, uh, it's more of the faith tradition. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to recognize also the faith tradition where the role of the woman is within that denomination as well and recognizing that also. So I think it's more of that um, because I do work with some faith communities where the male has more of a dominant role um, and they take, they take this project on yes. and they come up with a plan to implement it just as if I was to work with a field, a female ministry leader. I see Sheila and Pamela are shaking your head. Is there yes. <laughs> I see the church nods or the ministry nods or the faith nods. So I didn't know if you wanted to add on to something. I just had, um, uh, a man who lost his wife two years ago. And as is the case for so many of us in dementia education or in facilitating support groups with dementia education, um, if, you have, if you come from a caregiving past, you very often are compelled to make it easier for the next family if you possibly can. And that I see Pamela, yes, it is, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's just a compulsion. Um, it is such a difficult journey. And if we can make it better, then we try very hard. Most of the people who speak at our conferences and workshops have been caregivers, care partners in the past. This man just stepped up to a leadership role in our ministry. And I'm just so glad to have him. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you for those responses. I'll go into the next question because we're getting close to the hour or hour and a half. Um, so another question is, how do you sustain relationships through changes in church leadership and changes in organizational leadership? Mm -hmm. That's a very great question. Yeah. Um, some of that, so uh, Dr. Epps mentioned understanding kind of the, what are the traditional roles. So some of our, you know, like our three historical denominations within the African-American community, they have elections. So they're the leadership at the very top of their system. Those are overturning on a cyclic basis. <laughs> and then when they overturn on a cyclic basis, that may mean that the pastor you had been working with for the last five years is gone because they have gotten new orders to go and minister and shepherd another flock. The way that we've navigated that, and again, I think it comes back to once you have embedded yourself, your program, who you are, your staff, your people, your other external partners within that congregation, 
then you can really now kind of stem the tide because there, and that's by saying you're not only working with the pastor or dependent upon the pastor, you've made inroads with whoever's overseeing the minute, the women's ministry. You made inroads with who's doing stuff with youth. You've made inroads with who just is the elder, who is the mother of the church. Um, Cause she has been there and seen many a pastors come and go. <laughs> and so again, that's where um, I think that's how you overcome it is by make, and most of the time too, you're not gonna really ever be directly constantly working with that pastor because they have other obligations. So you really do want to, once you're in to ask them, so who, who can I speak with and work with to do and carry the heavy load for what we wanna do pastor once you have their blessing. So I think that that's the thing. And if you can, and I, I had to learn it, but I would challenge anyone, if you really are serious about this work, look at the faiths, look at the religious institutions, look and see what their historical infrastructures have looked like, learn them, know them. You yes. can't go and to an AME church and confuse them with the AME Zion church, definitely can't confuse them with a CME church, and please don't get their bishop wrong. <laughs> and so we have to also do a little bit of education <laughs> within that. And that's how you can navigate the overturning. And same thing with us, we should introduce whoever our new people. So if we leave our roles and it's a new person coming in to fill my space here as deputy director, I need to do a very warm, firm handoff to say, this is going to be the new person. This is going to be your new Pam. Um, and then same thing. And then that's really how you can navigate, um, you know, that turnover. Great. Are there any other responses to that question? Okay, perfect. I think we're getting down to like probably about the last question. And so it's always so difficult when we get towards the end because there's so many questions in the question box and not enough time. So please reach out to us if we have any other questions that we don't get a chance to answer. Um, but from, I think it's Eileen, um, she asks, perhaps this is a bit out of scope, where are there faith communities and similar groups for the Latino community specifically? I don't know if you all are aware of it. And if you are, if you could share some of those resources. I'm not aware of faith communities for Latino groups specifically. I can say that, um, our ministry welcomes all faiths, all cultures, everyone. Um, and it's, it's, I am hoping that one day we will all be able to um, say that every community has access to the kind of help that Ferron has so beautifully offered in the African-American community that Balm and Gilead has, has offered that all of you have done um, because the need is so great. Um, and, is, and of course, we know by 2050 that it, instead of every 65 seconds, it's going to be one and it's every 33 seconds. So we need all of us working for all cultures. Yes, I so appreciate that comment. It's all hands are on deck and all the things yes. yes. provide relevant resources for caregivers because we need them. Um, and they're such an integral part of what we do. And so I just want to take this time to once again to the presenters here today for coming to spend an hour and a half with us. We really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. Um, so I'll just go ahead because we have a, a couple more minutes. Um, so I want you all to save the date. So if you like this one, you're like part three. Um, and part three will be the final series of this webinar series. And you'll hear a little bit more from um, le about leading work with other faith organizations and their collaborations with public health. And so that date will be October 12th, same time from noon to 1.30 um, p.m. Eastern, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, always please stay connected with us. We have a host of information all of the time. You can visit us on our website, which is bolddementiacaregiving.org. I'll say it one more time, bolddementiacaregiving.org. We have the slides that were presented today that will be uploaded and also the recording from today. So, and we have a whole host of other information. And if you need assistance with any type of technical support, we're here to help you. So stay up to date. Follow us on Twitter if you are on the Twitter world. So follow us at Pico underscore D. 
If not, stay engaged with us on our website and we hope to see you back on October 12th. Thank you so much for attending today and thank you for um, our speakers. If you can take this time now to um, complete our brief evaluation form, we will greatly appreciate it so we can continue to have these great resources and webinars in the future. Thank you so much and have a great Wednesday. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks, bye. Take care everyone. Love you, Bitten family. You guys are oh, awesome. Oh, thank you. Thank so you. So, thank you. I was like, I'm going to keep up with all of you all. So when you yes. see my email. Please do. Please do. I got a coordinator in Georgia who I know she would love to connect with you all. Okay. Yes. yes. So, and I've attended you. some of your uh, seminars. The bomb I, I saw Alan.